Welcome to Unlayered. Uh, today, Dave and I are speaking with Profit. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Meta Profit, where the second E is a three. Um, so, Profit is the creator of the MetaDAO. And the best way to describe that is an experiment in human coordination. Uh, if you go on our website, which is at themetadao.org, you'll see the description is uh, the MetaDAO is a new cybernetic institution managed by programs stored on the Solana blockchain. In other words, managed by code. But instead of things like token voting or liquid democracies, which are concepts that have been explored in other DAOs before, the MetaDAO uses this different structure called a futurarchy. And that's something that we will talk about and get into throughout this interview. Um, but before we do that, uh, Profit, how's it going? Um, and how's the launch been so far with MetaDAO? It's going great. Uh, yeah, the launch has been better than I expected. Uh, I expected like 10 people to show up uh, and like 40 <laughs> people, or well, 60 people showed up to the DAO uh, and became members. And then 40%, 40 people or 42 people actually traded in the few target markets, which oh, wow. feels pretty cool. Like 42 people is probably too many people to fit in an apartment. And that many people have now traded in a completely new uh, governance mechanism, like a, a completely new kind of market. Uh, so yeah, pretty good. That's awesome. I mean, it's always exciting to see your baby, you know, come out and, and getting good response in the market. I know some of your videos and tweets got some love from guys like Anatoly and, and things like that on Twitter, just because it's so such a cool concept. Um, I think for some of our listeners, it would be useful to perhaps ease into the concept of a futarchy and just talk about governance in general. I think governance has been a big problem, both inside and outside of crypto. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've thought deeply about this. Uh, what do you think of different governance structures? Things like democracies are common in, in countries like the U.S., um, in DAOs and crypto specifically, you see a lot of, I guess, token voting mechanisms that emulate democracies to an extent and have their sets of issues. Um, how did you kind of f like end up at this space where you think futurarchies are the way to go versus previous ways of governing? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, well, first, uh, to preface my thinking in terms of which is best, I would just like to say that I think that. Governance is really, really, really important. Uh, not just like in a terms of feeling fairness or justice, but in terms of real economic reality. Like if you look at the difference between countries uh, that are poor, like Somalia, and countries that are rich, like most of uh, Western Europe and, and the US and Canada, uh, the main difference is institutions and governance. And so I feel like it's a really important problem and one that crypto is ideally would be the product of crypto, right? Like new institutions, uh, like Bitcoin is kind of this new institution. Uh, and most, a lot of DAOs are trying to be these new institutions. Um, and then when we come to specific governance strategies, so voting, uh, I mean, yeah, so there's voting, uh, there's dictatorship, uh, there's like real by with within voting, there's a voting of a small committee, and then there's voting with large committees, like maybe even a hundred million people committee in the case of a nation state democracy. And the main dictatorships actually have uh, some, some benefits to them. So like most early stage startups are run as dictatorships where the founder is making every big decision and, uh, and the benefit of that is that if the dictator is well aligned with the organization, then they have perfect incentive compatibility. Uh, like Jeff Bezos, when he ran Amazon, every decision he's making in the interest of, okay, what's going to make Amazon better? He's not thinking, okay, if this decision hurts Amazon, but helps Jeff Bezos, uh, I'm going to do it. I mean, maybe he would, but they're just, because he owns so much of it, there's not that uh, trade-off that comes up a lot of the time. Whereas in a, in a large quorum democracy, uh, such as the United States, uh, or such as yeah, in Western Europe, that's not the case. There are many situations where the, either the people who are 
governing, so the voters or the people who are appoint, appointed by the voters have clear incentive uh, miscompatibilities. So like with voting, uh, if you only own one one hundred millionth of, uh, if you're only one one hundred millionth of the voting power, you have a very small incentive uh, to research decisions and to actively engage, uh, which is why you see empirically uh, that democracies are actually not very good at representing the will of the people, because even if people actually pick the people, the policies are headed up, end up getting picked by uh, the special interest groups. Like, and, and, and this is my opinion, this was a Princeton study empirically uh, went through a bunch of different policies and looked at average, uh, average, uh, like what the average person thought of them, and then looked at whether or not those policies were enacted. And there's zero correlation. They found no or very almost statistically insignificant correlation between uh, things that were like 10% of people supported a policy and 90% of people supported a policy. Either way, they would still, uh, they still, like, it's, there's no difference in terms of whether or not that policy would get enacted. And so voting has some serious issues. Uh, and most DAOs today are voting uh, DAOs. And so you can see uh, the problems there, uh, like manifest again, where most of these DAOs, I used to work in Ethereum DeFi DAOs, and most of them are operated by the people on the ground, even if in name, the token voters are the ones in control. It's really the people who work for the DAO, like the quote unquote core contributors uh, who make the core decisions. And so it's not, they're not really DAOs. Uh, and that's that's how I see pretty much governance today in a more macro sense and um, in a DeFi crypto sense as well. Understood. I think oftentimes when we compare governance structures, um, it's sometimes useful to consider the trade-offs. And for instance, democracy, it's great in the sense that um, I, I guess it promotes freedom, equal rights, and maybe it's just not efficient for making decisions. And if those decisions get made, it's really hard to undo them um, and entire groups of people can get overlooked. You look at things that are more authoritarian or even monarchies, that centralization of power, to your point, like a startup CEO, leads to extremely efficient decision making and quick feedback loops. But maybe people abuse their power. Maybe personal freedoms and human rights are uh, hurt in that process. So how would you describe, like in this kind of web of different governance structures that have existed throughout society, you know, democracies, republics, monarchies, even like socialism, like, where does this fit in this broader web, if it does, this concept of futurarchy that you're alluding to? I think the closest uh, is Plato's philosopher kingdoms. Uh, so I think the MetaDAO is a philosopher kingdom where all the power is vested in what is hopefully an altruistic uh, and smart person, like philosopher. Uh, only that philosopher hence not to be, uh, happens not to be human as instead the market. So... We want to give all power to someone that uh, can make decisions in the interest of all of us. Uh, and the, but the benefit, because yeah, the problem with philosopher kingdoms, uh, and we actually had kind of philosopher kingdoms like medieval Europe uh, under uh, the Roman Catholic Church was kind of a philosopher kingdom uh, or tried to be. The problem with that is that you get the philosophers, quote unquote, not really acting like philosophers or not really acting in the interest of the people acting in the interest of themselves. Uh, and so because we have these great new things called blockchains, uh, I think there should be, well, yeah, the, the meta DAO is, is one attempt to use code, uh, and to try to create an algorithm, uh, that is like an altruistic philosopher. If that makes sense. I, lo I love that. And, um, as you say, from memory, Plato's philosophers, they were the sort of superhuman beings who would always be neutral arbiters uh, of the truth. Um, and I think crucially, the problem was that if you ever had someone like that, 
uh, they would never want to actually be in charge. I think that was sort of the, the conundrum of his philosopher's kingdoms. And generally, the people who want to be in charge are the ones who actually want to enrich themselves and skew the incentives um, to Im improve the standard of living. So I like the idea of using the credible neutrality of blockchains, uh, of code, uh, in order to become these neutral arbiters. Yeah, and I don't even know how many really true philosophers there are. Uh, I guess it depends on your view of how humans operate. I tend to think that like th those who are altruistic of us died out probably a few million years ago in human evolution. <laughs> uh, so the ones who remain are kind. We all have a little bit of greed in us, uh, and so it may just be that as well. Is there a difference between? Um... So a country, you're obviously accruing all of the resources, but then the people in charge are then supposed to try and give them to, you know, the subjects uh, throughout the lands. But in businesses, you're accruing resources to pay to the shareholders. So it just feels like it's a far more aligned system. You know, Jeff Bezos is the largest shareholder of Amazon stock, and therefore he wants to do everything in his power to improve the payout that goes to the shareholders. Whereas when you have governments, they're not really seeing the benefit. If you're giving everything to the, you know, the poorest 20% in the country, they're not really getting the benefit of that. And so there's just this natural sort of, uh, the, the incentives are skewed basically. And, and therefore they're probably more incentivized to try and get some of that money to go into their own pockets. Do you think there's a distinction between, uh, between the two? And does that shape how we should think about designing governance systems? I think there was a big difference between some uh, Jeff Bezos running Amazon and the government. Uh, but I don't think there's a big difference between appointed CEO who doesn't have a large stake in Amazon uh, running Amazon and a president running a country. Uh, because it, in both of those cases, you have someone who doesn't have, like appointed CEOs aren't given 10% of the company. Uh, and even 10% would not be that great from an economic alignment perspective. Uh, but they're generally given like 10 basis points uh, of the company, sometimes less if it's a, if it's a really large company. And so, yeah, in, in my experience as well, I used to work in uh, Web2 organizations and I saw that they are kind of like big tech companies are run like little governments with everyone's got their own uh, uh, different business units are kind of like these different feudal lords uh, that each have their own interests and not always working in the interest of the broader goal. Sometimes they are, uh, but, but yeah, it, early stage companies are like the perfect, like a startup is perfect from incentive alignment because everyone really wants it to succeed and people aren't, uh, incentivized to think about how they can maximize the share of their pie. They're incentivized to think about how they can maximize the pie. <laughs> How does this structure scale? And you brought up Web2 companies where, like you're right, it's early in the easy days when everyone has substantial equity, for instance, for them to see how that could benefit them from an economic standpoint to work really hard and have that company succeed. But once you get to a Google level where there's tens or hundreds of thousands of employees, I find that's where the inefficiencies creep in and people get motivated by other things, whether it's just they want to have a high head count, for instance. And so maybe even if that costs the company a lot of money, uh, it allows them to gain status in the organization. And like, I guess my question is when it comes to something like the MetaDAO or Futurarchy, it could work with 40 people, uh, like those 40 people that showed up on, on the first day. But how do you preserve all of those benefits you're talking about with incentive alignment through markets as this thing scales to something much bigger, if it does, I mean, does it scale to tens or hundreds of thousands of people? Is that kind of the goal there? Uh, yeah, scale is there a, a critical issue because if venture backed startups are already so incentive aligned, then there's really no point in building a really small uh, institution that is incentive aligned because you already have one. Uh, and so it's scale is really important. And I think even, even just like a base level, uh, you can think of Futarchy as replacing the board of directors. Uh, and so 
in that sense, uh, you get some benefits uh, and you get like a possibly perfectly incentive aligned board of directors. But as you point out, uh, Google, for example, is a large organization. And I don't know how much sway the board of directors has over like a something happening four, uh, four levels down in the corporate tree. And that's, uh, I have some ideas. So actually why it's called the MetaDAO uh, was the idea I came up with that made me want to pursue this, which is uh, basically an idea that allows you to scale Futarchy or possibly allows you to scale Futarchy if it works, where you split up the organization into a bunch of what I call member DAOs. And then every decision goes through the Futarchy process where uh, where you're guaranteed, like essentially what you do is for every decision, you allow people to speculate on how it's going to impact the market cap of all these individual member DAOs. And then you only do something if it's net positive. So for example, uh, if a given decision would increase the value of business unit A by 10 million, but it would decrease the value of business unit B by 15 billion, million, then it would be seen as net negative by the market. And so it wouldn't execute. Uh, but if it were the inverse where one is gaining 15 million and the other is losing 10, then it would execute. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. I am hopeful that it will scale, but frankly, like, I don't, I don't know. This is kind of uncharted ground, uh, Futarchy. Uh, and so we'll see. Can we, can we just get a bit more into the, the nitty gritty of it all? So where did Futarchy come from? Um, and how, how is it set up? Um, have you changed the, the fund? Obviously you're just talking about these metadals, but have you changed the fundamental, uh, processes of how this was originally envisaged to work? Um, has it, has it been used elsewhere? Yeah. Can we just go into the history of it and, and how you're implementing it? Sure. Uh, so future key was invented in 2000 by an economist named Robin Hanson. Uh, so yeah, 23 years now, uh, and it hasn't really been tried. Uh, there was a, uh, an L1 called Amaveo that ran one decision or a couple decisions in a semi futarchic manner. Uh, but. Other than that, uh, it hasn't really been tried. Uh, I would consider us like the first DAO ran by Futarchy. And the idea is essentially, yeah, to have markets govern decisions. So you can, I think the analogy that uh, makes it click for people is imagine that a company is run as a Futarchy and imagine that the company is deciding whether or not to fire the CEO. Uh, so today that's a board of directors just takes a vote, uh, but in a Futarchy, uh, the way it would work is the company's stock would split into two. You would have two markets for the company's stock. And one of them would be fire CEO stock. And one of them would be retained CEO stock. Uh, and then you would have some time period. So in our case, right now it's 10 days where you allow people to trade uh, on those stocks independently. And then after the period expires, uh, you look at the two markets and you look at their prices. And whichever the market values more is what you do. So uh, you, if the company is more valuable, if you fire the CEO, then you fire the CEO. And if the company is more valuable, if you retain the CEO, then you retain the CEO. Um, and then once you do that, you revert the other markets, uh, which like you revert the market that didn't actually happen, uh, which allows what that essentially allows is it allows investors to place trades that only get executed if an event happens, or it allows them to, uh, which allows them to speculate on what something would be worth if it were to happen, uh, in this case, the decision. And then it actually uses that knowledge of what people uh, are trading. It uses the knowledge of the conditional trades in order to actually make the decision. So it's kind of a recursive process where people are betting on what it would be worth if it were to happen. And then that their bets are being used to decide whether or not it does actually happen. You mentioned you, you have some initial members of the MetaDAO. Um, what are some examples of, of actual proposals, proposals that are being put forth by the MetaDAO? Like how are you guys, I guess, implementing this at such an early stage? What kinds of decisions are being put up to this betting markets mechanic? Sure. So the first proposal, uh, well, yeah, just for context, I view the MetaDAO as an economic organization. 
it has a token and I want its price to increase, but I don't want it to be like a meme coin. Uh, and so my goal is to increase the amount of discounted cash flows to the MetaDAO. Uh, and so what we've started, the first proposal was uh, to create an LST ride platform, which I know you had on the LST or the Marinade head of comms before, and he talked about the opportunity to build an LST ride platform. And so our idea was actually to go build that. Uh, and the proposal ended up passing, uh, like 40, yeah, 42 people traded in the market and the past price, uh, the price of, so the past prices, the price of meta, if this proposal was to pass, I think the mid price was like $14 in the end and the fail price was like $5. Uh, it's a pretty big discrepancy. And so the proposal ended up passing and uh, the proposal, uh, transferred a uh, 1,000 meta to me to kick off uh, the process of building this LST platform, which was all automatic. Uh, it wasn't just like, this is a voting process, but then uh, at the end of the day, it's people making the decision. Like, no, it was just an SVM instruction that was automatically executed by the program. And um, then uh, while we were talking to Marinade, uh, we're, we're having to do some pivoting basically in terms of how we're thinking about that. They want to develop their own internal solution, but they want to, uh, us to help uh, them design it. And so right now uh, we're figuring that out. Uh, and so that's like the type of proposal that, that would be there. Like if you read the proposal, it's very uh, corporate, I guess you could say. Like it shows what do we expect the total addressable market of this to be uh, how could we monetize it and what percentage and like, what would be the projected cash flows that we could get out of this? Uh, and another proposal that I think will go live soon is to, uh, is to develop a UI for open book V2. Uh, they're going to possibly probably pay us a grant to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, stuff like that. In the long term, I want to build, uh, I want the MetaDAO to be able to fund big projects, like cool projects, but right now. We have no money uh, and or very little, right? This is a new organization and we don't have any legitimacy other than just a few cool people in Solana retweeting us. Uh, and mm -hmm. so the goal is to get to legitimacy as fast as possible. And then hopefully from there, that we'd be able to leverage that to either raise money or get more people excited and like funnel that into building new and interesting projects. Can we just... Uh put a spotlight on exactly what the so you said fifteen dollars was the the passing price basically for this first proposal so does that mean that all of the metadao tokens which were previously in existence um people are saying if this proposal goes ahead i now value all of them at fifteen dollars um so that's first question and then second question are people injecting additional funds into this to push that price up is everyone having to pay the same $15? Can you, can you just sort of clarify a bit on, on that side of things? Sure. Uh, so yeah, the, that was the mid price at the end of the proposal. Uh, so that deviated quite a bit on the first day. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not the same price for everyone. There's a consistent, there's an order book, uh, that ran through the whole period. It's open. It's based on open book V2. Uh, and on the very first day, the bid was like a dollar and the ask was 790. So we had a pretty widespread on meta tokens. Uh, and then uh, over the like first two days, they kind of converged. Uh, and yes, yeah, so you're paying with uh, USDC. The way it works is you would take USDC and you uh, put that into uh, the market. And so what you do is you take USDC. So say I take five USDC and then I make conditional USDC. And that gives me back, if I have five USDC, it would give me back five conditional on pass USDC and five conditional on fail USDC, uh, which just like that's USDC I get back in those conditions. So if I just mint and I don't do anything else, uh, then I've kind of, that's a net zero transaction. If it fails, I'll be able to redeem my conditional on fail USDC. And if it passes, I'll be able to redeem my conditional on pass USDC. Now, uh, if I want to speculate that this proposal will be valuable or will accrue value to the meta token, then I, what I would do is I would take my conditional on pass USDC and trade it for conditional on pass meta. And then if it passes, I can redeem that conditional on pass meta for real meta. 
uh, and I've kind of like front run the decision. Uh, or if it fails, I can go back and redeem my conditional on fail USDC for canonical or real USDC. And uh, yeah, so the actual prices uh, is uh, the pray the fourteen dollars I was mentioning is the is the price of conditional on pass meta quoted in conditional on pass USDC. Uh, and so it's like, yeah, what would this be worth if it were to pass? Let's talk about potential downsides. So I think, if, let me preface by saying, I think it's, this mechanism is very cool and it's an experiment that needs to happen and there's a lot of promise. Let's talk about perhaps what happens when you turn everything into every decision into essentially a betting market um like how do you think about market manipulation the influence of you know if this continues to succeed and people start making money and potentially joining the dow as well the influence of you know, wealthier market participants if that's a consideration or if you already have a mechanism to deal with that or just maybe even the 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 main criticism i think which is kind of hard to guard against is like you you shift focus when you turn things into as you're saying like if, if decision a passes this is the value of the token versus decision b um what if the decision has such a long time horizon like for instance spacex like let's build a rocket right like it's just going to hemorrhage money for years and then it's kind of a moonshot on year 10 you launched it becomes a valuable company like how do you think about some of these downsides of, of turning things into markets when you're making decisions uh, yeah, I think the main benefit, the main drawback is this thing called Keynesian BD contests, which I'll get into. But before I get into that, I'll just say the goal that we're trying to achieve is not to build some like the platonically ideal governance system. The goal is just to beat what currently exists. Uh, and if you look at markets, they've been compared against a existing systems uh, a few times empirically. So like, for example, uh, with presidential elections, uh, there have been researchers that have gone through and looked at uh, pollsters' predictions on who's going to win the election, and then uh, the prediction markets' pr uh, prediction on who's going to win the election. And empirically, prediction markets are better. Uh, in 1980, when the Challenger space shuttle blew up, uh, it took the government two to four months to figure out that it was uh, Morton Thiokol's O-rings that caused the crash. Uh, but the market had priced it into Morton Thiokol's shares within 14 minutes. Morton Thiokol's shares have, have fallen much below uh, the other government contractors. Um, but yeah, so the, but the main, so like when it comes to pricing the future, like SpaceX, I think that one is, that just may be a fault in humans, right? We are not good at pricing the future. And so that's what makes markets not good at pricing the future. Um, now, there is a pretty, uh, you know, there is a very big problem, uh, or we'll see how big a problem it is, which is Keynesian beauty contests, where in markets, a lot of the times, especially in crypto, people don't buy things because they think they're intrinsically valuable. They think they're, they, they buy them because they think another person is going to buy them after them. Uh, and so they try to like front run the other person's irrationality. Um, and that's a problem that you don't really have with voting. Like, I don't think that people vote uh, on for person X because uh, they want to front run another person voting on person X. It doesn't really work like that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that's the main problem. Uh, the main thing that we can do to address that is to make people feel like the marginal buyer is not irrational. Uh, so try to create a community um, that is full of like, rational people, uh, which is why uh, we don't really publish the Discord in a bunch of places. And we try uh, to like keep the community kind of tight knit because we want to, we want people to feel like the other participants in the market are rational. Uh, but it will definitely be a problem. And I'm curious to see how it plays out. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it, to, to deal with that? Because I'm just thinking in my head, if someone proposed, let's YOLO half of the treasury into Bonk because, you know, Bonk to 100 million. Um, 
you know, if you went, if you gave that to the market wise, certainly the Solana participants, I, th I fear that you might get over 50% say, yes, let's do it. Um, so as you say, it's a really difficult one. Um, but then your solution, it sounds like you're planning on keeping it to quite a small community. So again, maybe it comes back to Sal's question about does this scale? Um, because as I said, if you, if the, if every member of the Solana community was in this, they would maybe press the yes button, uh, to the bonk proposal. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a serious, uh, concern in terms of that. Like I am, I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just scared that someone's going to turn this into a meme coin. And then suddenly the metadata is going to start voting on, uh, whether or not we should start funding the Jamaican bobsled team with the treasury or something like that <laughs> to increase the memetic value or something. Uh, I really, really hope that doesn't happen. Uh, but in terms of does this scale, I feel like it does. Um, if you look at a lot of web two internet platforms, they started really small, uh, and tried to get the fire burning really bright and then gradually expanded from there. So like Yelp, for example, Jeremy Stoppelman, uh, started Yelp as by handing out, uh, Yelp shirts in nightclubs in San Francisco. Uh, if you look at Glassdoor. They started by uh, interviewing people outside the at the Starbucks outside the Cisco headquarters uh, with like a paper and a clipboard and just writing those reviews down and putting them in the glass door. Uh, and uh, Discord obviously started with gaming, uh, like small communities of gaming, and now it's become this thing that's much broader. Uh, and so my goal is to get the fire burning really, really bright with a few people. Uh, and I think over time, we can naturally scale from there. But my goal is just to get the core interaction unit, uh, which is like people trading in these markets, uh, really good. And then scale uh, is, I don't view as like that hard a problem. Uh, or it's, it's not the key problem in a future key because you don't necessarily even want many more market participants. You just want the quality of the market participants to be very high. So someone like Curve, they ask the people proposing and voting on governance proposals, they ask them to lock the um, Curve token for a period of up to four years to ensure that they are committed to the project. Um, is there a, a risk as well that people, maybe from, say, there's an opposing DAO, um, which wants MetaDAO to, to die, you know, grind it into the dust, um, what stops people from coming in and just uh, like pushing the decision to always the, the worst decision um, to try and bring about Meta DAO's downfall? Um, I think those problems, like manipulation, essentially, is what I categorize this as more broadly. Uh, and I think markets are actually pretty good at, uh, at least relative to voting. Like if you look at VECRV, the curve system, uh, manipulation is actually encouraged, right? Like you have a bribe platform where people actually pay other people to vote a certain way. Um, in a market though, if you move the market price away from fair value, which obviously like intrinsic value, uh, is, is not perfect. Like markets are not always pricing things based on fair cash flows. Uh, but anyone who's worked around TradFi, uh, knows that it's actually pretty good at, uh, at, at doing this. So like if someone buys a bunch of stock right now, a noise trader comes along, there's likely going to be a stat arm firm, a statistical arbitrage firm that comes in like right after them within microseconds to offset their, uh, thing where they're betting on, okay, this person is pushed away from fair market value. So I'm going to push it back. And, uh, so there are like, there are market participants that actively look for manipulation because a manipulation means that someone is trying to push it away from fair market value. And they use that as an opportunity to either short if someone is trying to buy a bunch, uh, or to long if someone is shorting and trying to push the market lower. Uh, and so it's not perfect. Like obviously, uh, AMC, uh, and GameStop and stuff like that does happen. Uh, but that's, we, see a lot of that. We don't see a lot of the 99.9% .9 of the time when markets function well, uh, and relatively efficiently. Uh, and so, yeah, I think manipulation kind of gets resolved by just market participants, uh, looking for those opportunities. What's been your, have you read network stake by 
topology, like what's been your kind of take on, on that view of the world? And it seems like this experiment with MetaDAO kind of aligns pretty closely with, with that longer term thesis. Uh, it, it said differently, just like an online community that is built on some like core principle, uh, which in this case is a futarchy that can potentially replace, you know, components of society that we use today. I mean, uh, what's your kind of your take on, on that book and everything like that? Yeah, I like the network state concept. I really like the ball you wrote about it because now people view me as less crazy when I talk about what we're working on, right? Uh, kind of legitimizes the space. Um, I'm, I'm really curious to see how it all plays out. I think there are a lot of network state projects that are trying to go after land first, uh, mm -hmm. like Praxis is an example of them and that, and I, I really hope they do succeed. Uh, my concern is what prevents them from going back. Like they are obviously started as this, uh, problem started as a solution to address the problem of how nation states have turned out, but what prevents them from going back into the same, uh, the same habits that led us here into the first place. Uh, and so that's why I'm personally excited about building governance first, as opposed to land first. Um, but yeah, I think we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, it's still super early. Uh, I don't think there are any projects that currently have any land secured other than, uh, Liberlandia has like a tiny little plot, but they're, Croatia doesn't even allow them to access it. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I have some concerns about the, yeah, like what's going to prevent them from, uh, going back into the same habits. Well, actually you brought up a good point that I want to use as a springboard for the next question, which is a lot of these experiments we do, even just cryptocurrencies in general, start out ideologically sound. And then over time we see actors basically revert back to the exact behaviors that we wanted to get away from. For example, the idea of Bitcoin being a check against money printing and a hedge against inflation. That works great. We inspired a bunch of cryptocurrencies. And now uh, entire companies in crypto, let's take Olympus Dow, for instance, is like the key example here and like all the Olympics forks from the last bull run, uh, they just inflated everybody out of any wealth and just turned into a Ponzi scheme. And it's just kind of funny that we enable people to essentially print money with tokens and um, you know, deceive the public into inflation schedules and or emission schedules over time, um, which is exactly what the whole point of crypto was to get away from abusing that aspect of currency issuance. So I guess my question here is it's like a double-edged sword. We have these technological primitives that enable us to do really good things, but also abuse them and, and do really bad things at massive scale. Um, what's your view on just in the future, if you, as you see kind of projects like the MetaDAO succeed potentially in that world, how are we coordinating across different organizations? Now, how do you view currencies in general? Yeah. Um, Bitcoin is great, isn't it? I feel like it's the only project that actually has stayed true to its ideological roots, which is essentially 21 billion and don't screw anything up. Like don't change anything about the protocol. Uh, and that's actually what they've done. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, to your point, a lot of, uh, like look at the, what's going on in Ethereum with Lido right now, where now you could say that they are kind of centralized maybe more than we'd like them to be. Uh, and I think the core problem with all that is governance, uh, because that's, that's the problem that hasn't been solved yet. Um, is we, all these systems like web three, for example, is pitched just this idea where you have the users govern the protocol. Uh, what does that actually mean today? Token voting, uh, which is similar to what we had before, I guess now you call them the community instead of calling them the shareholders for whatever reason. Uh, but it's not like you've unlocked some new insight. Um, the other cool projects are like, uh, Rye, uh, on Ethereum where they, um, don't have like a, a, a governance structure that 
uh, governs over arbitrary decisions, but they just govern over interest rates. And it's completely algorithmic. They just use like a PID controller that's embedded in a smart contract. And so that way they can also be guaranteed that they are ideologically uh, pure, or like stay with what the root of the project is. But, um, but yeah, I think the core problem uh, with all this crypto stuff of like returning to the old ways is governance, right? It feels like that's kind of what we're lacking today. And I hope that if we don't figure it out, someone else does. Can you say one day a presidential election being decided using Futaki? Definitely. 100%. And, and that would be the, the whole globe basically participating in that election process. Yeah, exactly. It's super interesting. Uh, because, uh, yeah, all the heat that Facebook receives, you know, for uh, ads paid for by Russia. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you basically have to completely shift your whole mindset um, to, to envisage that as, as a way for, um, for future elections to be decided. But as you say, um, no answer is currently great. Uh, and this is, uh, you gave some great examples earlier of how um, trading can be more efficient than, than any other form. So, yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, yeah, I don't know how the normies, if Future IP6 does succeed, I wonder how the normies will perceive it. Because on one hand, yeah, you could say it's empirically better, but I don't think that normal people like the idea of decisions just being decided by trading. I don't know. Right. I tend to agree. There, There is like a human element to it that, yeah, it, it, it's unclear if it scales well. <laughs>
people have emergency funds where they store three months or six months of expenses or whatnot if they get laid off. Uh, and so you probably don't want to store that in stocks and bonds. Uh, but what you could do there instead of money is to use commodities futures. Uh, so uh, like, let's just say you, let's just say you spend all your money on gas, uh, which is a crazy situation, but I'll sh show in a second that it's going to be generalized. So you spend all your money on gas, then you can just buy oil, oil futures. And that way, even if the price of gas rises, uh, you, you aren't taking that risk. Uh, you it's, the profit from your futures position will offset the increased cost that you have to pay at the pump. And uh, so for things that are non-commoditizable, uh, so like rent uh, in whatever city you live in, you can have synthetic commodities futures as well. Uh, so like parcel uh, is, they don't use futures, but uh, perps, but it's similar. It's a synthetic product uh, and you could basket these up. So like, if you are a 30 something who lives in New York city, you could just hold a basket uh, that tries to mimic the purchasing power or like the purchasing uh, goods of a 30 person year old in New York city. Uh, and everyone can pick their own basket. Uh, there will probably be some more common baskets than others, uh, but that would be better than currencies because then everyone knows that it's like their expenses. It's like they've pre-bought for the next three months. And so they don't have a risk that they get inflated uh, or like the value of their currency decreases, uh, which happens. And then for, uh, so that's store value and medium of exchange. And then for unit of account, you could either use those commodity baskets uh, and you don't even necessarily need to hold the commodity basket that's it's used as a unit of account. So maybe uh, France has like France uh, commodity basket that tries to mimic uh, the goods that a typical French person buys, but maybe only like 10% of people actually hold that. They all have their own specialized uh, ones, uh, but it still can be used as a unit of account uh, where someone could put on their like coffee shop, okay, one coffee is three of these uh, commodity baskets, and then I can instantly swap into that and then give it to you, and then you can swap into whatever you want. Uh, or you could use a decentralized unit account like Ampleforth, uh, which I think is like a rebasing one, which I think is really cool. Uh, and those are not currencies, but they do provide a stable unit of account that would be better uh, than a money unit of account because a big problem with money is lending. Uh, like when you lend money, you don't know how much purchasing power you're going to get back because the amount you're getting back is in uh, uh, dollars normally if it's international or whatever the local currency is, if it's local. Uh, and you don't know how much that's going to be worth in terms of real goods. And so a rebasing unit of account could actually be stable in purchasing power. And so you would know exactly as a lender how much purchasing power you're going to get back or as uh, someone who borrows money, uh, so how much purchasing power you're going to have to pay to service the debt. Uh, and so uh, we now in DeFi have things that either off, like get rid of the need, issue the need for a, a medium of exchange or are better than current unit of account uh, and uh, store value. They're better than money at doing those things. And so, yeah, if you believe that uh, people follow their incentives, uh, it means that over time, currencies will become less important uh, if, uh, if people, if we adopt uh, DeFi, which maybe we wouldn't adopt DeFi. But my point is just that if we do, uh, then currencies will become less important. Dave is laughing. Uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I've never heard the commodities side of things. Um, I'm sure Sal's got loads of questions. Yeah. The first one I want to come in with is, you say for the medium of exchange, I, I can't remember which asset you were talking about, maybe Meta token. Uh, Sal's got Bonk and you want to exchange between the two. You say that with DeFi, you can just do that. But on DeFi, you are going through most likely Sol, maybe USDC, because that is the liquid pair with each of those smaller assets. So I don't quite buy that you don't need that medium account unless you're imagining a world where every single tiny asset is paired um, and instantly transferable and there's a highly liquid pool um, between each other, which to me isn't how DeFi is currently set up today. This is a great point. Um... And yeah, so today how DeFi is set up is to go through mainly USDC or uh, USDT as the pairs. Uh, but it actually uh, doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so balancer pools, for example, uh, can be multi-asset. So you can imagine 
uh, like Bonk would be paired against, I don't know, S&P 500, and then S&P 500 would be paired against Apple shares uh, in these like pools. And then you could swap through that or you would swap through that. And it wouldn't take any mental effort from your part. Jupiter or one inch or whatever aggregator in the front would just figure out that path. And like a chain lightning, it would just automatically go through. Uh, and then uh, the other one was Bankware uh, V2 actually used an interesting mechanism uh, where they, on Ethereum, uh, you have to minimize gas. Like that's the thing that everyone's trying to do. Uh, and so in Uniswap, when you do a swap through two pools, it costs these two extra uh, gas, uh, like S stores uh, is what it's called in EVM opcodes. So essentially you have to transfer, uh, like if I'm doing a swap from a Uni to a BAT, uh, it has to transfer the ETH from the uh, Uni pool to the BAT pool. And they wanted to optimize a way that uh, those two transfer uh, or those two S stores uh, just for gas. And so what they ended up doing is by accident inventing uh, a AMM system that works without uh, a middle currency. And so it just like has all the individual currencies. Uh, and then they have their internal, uh, just an internal like ledger thing that keeps track of what things are priced at relative to each other. Uh, but yeah, today it's all based on currency pairs. The bet would be that uh, if currencies become less important, then uh, we'll probably want to start shifting away from this, right? Like people don't want to create currency pair. Like people aren't going to want to trade stocks and, and bonk. Uh, if if US dollars start depreciating and start being seen as more of a shit coin, then we'll probably start wanting to move away from that. Uh, and And there are mechanisms for us to do that. What was your response? I don't know if you saw this on uh, X recently, but Brian Armstrong put out a, a post about how he, he thinks basically that crypto is not going to replace the dollar anytime soon, but rather serve as a, like a check and balance that'll complement it and also just be the key, I guess, to extending Western civilization and that fiat and crypto can coexist for a long time. Um, I think the best example of this is USDC, where maybe in 2016 or 17, everyone thought they're going to be buying coffees with Bitcoin. Uh, but really, it seems like they'll just be doing it with dollars on blockchains, um, like Circle's doing with USDC or, or Tether or what have you. Now, you brought up Ampleforth, with, which I guess is like a non-dollar denominated uh, flat coin or number stay flat technology. But regardless, what do you think of Brian's thesis, because it does seem in some ways to uh, be almost a complete opposite view of what you're taking. Um, yeah, I think it is a pretty opposite view. And I think most of crypto is predicated on this opposite view that we will need uh, other currencies like Bitcoin. Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it may just not work out like we originally thought. I think it would be totally reasonable to think that Bitcoin will be the alternative to the US dollar. And people weren't thinking in when, De when Bitcoin was started in 2009 or whatever uh, about DeFi. It didn't exist yet. Uh, but I think if you just look at the incentives, uh, then there's a decent chance that Bitcoin wouldn't actually be needed at all. Uh, and that instead we would just have no currencies. And in terms of what the impact that would be on Western civilization, I am a programmer, uh, but I have done some wading into that arena. Uh, and uh, I think moneylessness or Bitcoin uh, becoming a competitor to the US dollar could be good. Yeah, like I agree with him on that. If you look at uh, European countries after World War II, uh, the UK returned to the gold standard, uh, and so like kept its short up its currency and then had a period of economic stagnation. France did the opposite where they inflated their currency a bunch, uh, and had a period of economic growth. Uh, and then, uh, there were, there were some other countries in the middle that kind of had middle results with economic growth. Um, and economically, uh, though I think currency listness would be even better because economically what causes recessions and depressions 
is people saving uh, more than they spend. Um, and like, this is the Keynesian interpretation, at least. If you read uh, his stuff, he talks about, yeah, if people save more, that's what creates uh, the lack of demand in the economy. Uh, and as long as wages can't reprice themselves uh, quickly, which is like the stickiness of wages, then you uh, create unemployment, uh, which is like what happened in the Great Depression. Uh, and so if you don't have currencies, then you have to either spend or to invest the wealth that you have. And so we could potentially, if we move into this world, uh, move into a place where recessions or depressions are not possible to have because you can't save more than you spend or you invest. Right. I think it gets at that other point that he was making in his post slash thread, which is depending on what currency you're denominating into. If it's deflationary, um, it means the the bar for lending is higher because people want the return to be better than holding the currency, which is, I guess, increasing in value over time. Then the inverse is true if it's really inflationary, um, where now you're, you're, the bar is a lot lower. Uh, because holding it is making you poorer, essentially. And perhaps that's kind of the mindset that people are getting into these days. Um, but awesome. I mean, we, we've covered a lot of topics here today uh, and something that I don't think we've ever done in an episode, which is just opining on this future kind of governance structure and how crypto primitives actually make this possible to implement and experiment with. Um, so I guess a bit of a closing question is, what are you looking forward to? What's kind of like the... The, the longer term vision here, what's, what are you excited about with the meta DAO that perhaps no one is uh, focusing in on yet? I'm excited about, um, I mean, I'm just excited about this becoming a legitimate thing uh, because once this is making revenue or if this is making revenue, I should say like, this is an experiment. It could totally fail. Fusarchy could not work or we could execute poorly, but if it does work, it would just be really, really cool to have a institution that is actually making revenue so that people see it as real, but works in a completely different way than existing institutions work. And I think that could be like, like this really could be the use case that justifies crypto's existence, I feel like, if it works, uh, because that is kind of what crypto is here to do, right? We don't, we don't build things, uh, like we don't build houses or we don't get people from A to B and we don't produce food for people or widgets. Uh, all we do is build institutions like Bitcoin is the most prominent example, but hopefully we build other institutions as well. Like that's all general purpose blockchains are for. Uh, and so it's exciting to me to be a part of uh, a new one uh, that could work, has a non-zero chance of working. And yeah, I think I'm just really excited to see how this plays out. We're equally excited, man. It's uh, one of my biggest, I guess, pet peeves with crypto and DAO specifically is we keep assuming that democracies and direct voting are a good thing when you know voter apathy and, and just all the problems of it actually get magnified when you turn that into a token and make it even more of a direct relationship. So we're super excited that you're experimenting and trying something different. That's the whole point. That's why we have this technology is to experiment. So. We appreciate your contributions and really excited to see what MetaDAO uh, grows into. Yeah, me too.